green. Okay. Now hit it again it and it'll go off. Okay. Each rank counts to one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Get down. General Lew Wallace, when he first chose to defend this particular location, the Monocacy Junction, had 2,300 men to the 1st Separate Brigade. That's all he had, and he knew that he was facing Jubal Early's entire corps, three divisions of veterans. And he chose to stand and fight, but he was outnumbered approximately nine to one. Fortunately for history and for us, the citizens of the United States, these numbers were used. They knew that defeat would be the result of what they did that day. I personally have trouble understanding those sorts of things. And that's why I come here every July night to pay tribute to those men who face overwhelming odds that their memory will not be forgotten. You gentlemen here are just a small handful of one of them. Just a small group out of a nation of 250 million who tend to forget. But you have not forgotten. You are to be commended for remembering those that made it possible for us to enjoy the fruits of the United States of America.
Crawford was offered any better money than of course $200,000 was leveled on the city of Frederick in exchange for the not burning government stores and indeed laying waste to the city itself. At the time, Frederick City had a population of $800,000. commanded by Major General Lewis Wallace, the 1st Separate Brigade, 8th Army Corps, commanded by Brigadier General Erastus B. Tyler. Five companies of the 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade under the command of Captain Charles J. Brown. The 3rd Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, Colonel Charles Gilpin. 11th Maryland, Colonel William T. Landstreet, commanding. Three companies of the 144th Ohio and seven companies of the 148th Ohio, Colonel Allison T. Brown. The Baltimore Battery under the commanded Captain F. Alexander. The 3rd Division, 6th Corps Army of the Potomac, under the command of Brigadier General James T. Rippon. 1st Brigade, commanded by Colonel William S. Truex. 14th New Jersey, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel C.K. Hall. The 106th New York, commanded by Captain Edward M. Payne. The 151st New York, Colonel William Emerson, commanding. The 87th Pennsylvania, Lieutenant Colonel James A. Stahl, commanding. The 10th Vermont, Colonel William W. Henry, commanding. 2nd Brigade, under the command of Colonel Matthew R. McClellan. 9th New York Heavy Artillery, commanded by Colonel William H. Seward. The 110th Ohio, Lieutenant Colonel Otho H. Binkley, commanding. Detachment of the 122nd Ohio, Lieutenant Charles J. Gibson, commanding. 126th Ohio, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron W. Everight, 138th Pennsylvania, Major Lewis A. May, commander. Of the cavalry, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel B.R. Clendenin. The 8th Illinois, Lieutenant Colonel Clendenin, commanding. A detachment of the 159th Ohio, Mounted Infantry. Captain Edward A. Clyde, Captain Henry S. Allen, commanding. A detachment of mixed cavalry, Major Charles, Charles A. Wells, commanding. And the Loudoun Rangers of Virginia. The Union loss in this battle was 98 killed, 594 wounded, 1,188 missing, for a total of 1,880 total out of an estimated effective strength of 6,050. that Minoxidil was a defeat. It was a, a tactical defeat for 
General Wallace's Union troops. But in another sense, of course, it was a victory, and a great victory. U.S. Grant once said that in defeat, Wallace gained a greater victory than often falls to the lot of a commander who triumphs militarily. Wallace, of course, realized that his army had to hold Early's numerically superior force of Confederates back, and they did that very well throughout that very hot and bloody day. <coughs> I think some of the hardest fighting, man for man, of the entire Civil War was here in this little battle. General Gordon, a great Confederate commander, probably one of the best generals the South had, one of the bravest, said that only one other in time in the whole war at Spotsylvania on May 12th were his troops so swayed by a martial delirium. In other words, these men were so carried away that it's almost as if the orders didn't have to be given. Every man really was fighting on his own hook, north and south at that point. The officers in command really had very little to do, except leave, and they did that well. And a lot of them paid the price in blood. But Wallace, in later years, I think, summarized it very well when he said that a monument ought to be erected on this field over the graves of the dead. And for many years, the dead were buried on this field. Most were later removed to Antietam National Cemetery. But Wallace said, a monument ought to be erected over the graves of the Union dead that said, these men died to save the national capital. And they did. Colonel Tavener, up in the field right next to the house. The 14th New Jersey, an instrumental unit in that portion of the fight. But eventually, as General Gordon's entire division came across, as the railroad bridge, the Hubbard Bridge, uh, were threatened by Rhodes and Ramsey's division, the old Jug Bridge, which was up where Route 40 crosses the Monocacy, was threatened, the line was just stretched too thin to hold. And again, Gordon's men struck at the position held by the 6th Corps, and eventually pushed them back to the road right behind us. And that's where the last stand was made. You can still see the traces of the old road embankment. They used it as a trench, as a, as a breastwork, and fired into the Confederates uh, at almost point-blank range, covering the retreat. There was a private Nichols in the 61st Georgia who talks about a good friend of his being shot just as he reached the foot of the Thomas Drive, the drive that's still there today. Shot in the head, and he could see this man sitting there wiping his brains off of his forehead seemingly impervious to the pain, but the man later died, of course. Uh, Nichols, this private soldier in the 61st Georgia, saw his colonel and his lieutenant colonel both killed as they charged the 6th Corps. And I think the terrible casualties among the Confederate yeah. officers are testimony to the marksmanship and the courage of the 6th Corps. So when we look at these the Greek cross on the Pennsylvania Monument and on the Vermont Monument. No matter what state we honor, no matter what core badge we wear on our forage cap, you have to owe a debt of gratitude to the good old gallant Sixth Corps, really one of the finest corps in that army. There are not many monuments on this field. You probably are familiar with the 14th New Jersey Monument stands on the other side of the river. In fact, that regiment fought here on Thomas property. But I don't think these men would have erected these monuments if they didn't want this field to be preserved and this battle to be remembered. Because every man that fought here for the Union knew that with their blood, they were saving the national capital, just as the law was said. And the old veterans came here and erected these monuments to honor the men who died. They didn't want this place to be forgotten. They didn't want monocacy to be absorbed into Washington, Frederick, or be turned into condominiums or shopping. They wanted this ground to be burned to the last forever. And of course, we all know that places like the Nassau Battlefield are under attack, threatened by people who just don't value their sacrifices. But of all the battlefields that are threatened, I think this is perhaps, in some respects, the most important because it did save the city of Washington by buying time. 
These men were fighting for time and they knew it. Just as the Confederates were fighting to drive them from the field because they knew if they routed these men in their first attack, they could march on to Washington. As it was, it took a day of blood for the Confederates to rout the troops here, and they couldn't pursue. It was too late in the day. The next day, the heat beat down, men collapsed by the wayside. By the time they got even close to Washington, the Confederate Army was in no mood or condition to fight. So the men who put these monuments up, the Union veterans, realized the courts displayed and wanted this place preserved. William Henry Seward, Jr., Colonel of the 9th New York Heavy Artillery, son of the great Secretary of State of the Lincoln Administration, was wounded here. His horse was shot under him. His ankle was broken. He barely got off the field riding on a mule. He took his handkerchief and put it to the mule's mouth and used it as a, as a bridle. At first, he was reported dead. That's the word that reached his father in Washington. Seward, in later years, was very active in veterans' affairs, uh, wrote a letter to one of the GAR publications and said, by all means, monocracy should be made a national park. And this same sentiment was echoed in the Confederate Veteran magazine. A number of Confederate veterans as recently as the 1930s wrote to that publication and said, essentially, there are hundreds of monuments at places like Gettysburg. We've preserved places like Chickamauga, but monocracy too should be preserved. Even though it was a Confederate defeat, there was great valor displayed here by the Confederate troops. We should remember that honor. Our points of gray stand here. Which a man on the street would never have heard of, and probably never will. But we know the value of this place, just as our forebears did. And they held the fabric of the Union together with threads of blood. To ever allow them to be forgotten. So I, I certainly hope that we can stand together in comradeship and respect for those brave men and see that monocacy is preserved. Thank you. I can't think of anything dealing with history that gets more coverage in the press than the battle The people that I see on the street who know me say, were you there? They ask about it. They're interested. And it's the reenactors of America who keep this history of our country in front of the public. What you're doing has value. We enjoy it. We enjoy it a lot. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't put all the money into it. But we do. And it's good that we enjoy it. But don't forget what you're doing for the country. You're helping the country to remember. You're putting it on the paper. You're, you're reminding them. And if we keep reminding them, perhaps they'll get the message and help us. I think maybe we ought to take a moment now to remember some of our friends who are no longer with us. I'd like to mention specifically Steve Solon of the First Minnesota, who passed away some years ago. Many of us knew Steve, he was a good man. He would be here with us today, I'm sure. So let us please remember him today. I'd like to say something. Please feel free to come forward.
Order. Mark. This is probably the purest event I know of this country. As was previously said, a true commemoration. Not tainted by settlers or hawkers or those sorts of things that seem to creep into the hobby. Glad that we come here like this. A very simple and plain man. Just makes me feel good to come here and see all these people. I don't know how we want to do this. Files left. Take another one from a different angle. Yeah, we always get double prints. Good. Oh, sure. Ah! <laughs> 